Hello and welcome to the online service from Nambour Anglican Parish, South East Queensland, Australia. My name is Ralph Bowles. I'm the priest in charge of this parish in the Anglican Church, Southern Queensland. This service is a brief explanation of the Christian gospel, a brief act of worship, and we pray that in listening to it and watching it, you will find encouragement in your search for God, if you're searching for God, or in your relationship with God, if you want to express faith and hope. Here is a verse from the Apostle John to open our service today. From 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. May God bless you today as you join your spirit with God's spirit in worship and fellowship. Well, we get now in this series on the seven deadly sins to what most of the theologians regard as the root sin behind them all, um, the sin of pride, oh, the sin of pride. Before that, I just want to say, um, in light of the fact that um, Queen Elizabeth passed away the other week, um, we've had a powerful reminder in her of, uh, as far as we can tell from what people say about her, who knew her, of the combination of great high status with um, real humility and concern for other people. I was, uh, saw uh, the speech that Boris Johnson made in the Parliament about the Queen. All the parliamentarians and the Commons spoke about her. And um, he said that uh, when you saw the Queen at home, you know, relaxing at home and having a social time, um, you realise that he was, I think his words were, a one-bar radiator and Tupperware lady. <laughs> she was not um, full of her high graces. She liked the simple life. Um, we don't know her heart, of course, but uh, there seems little doubt from what people who knew her have said that she saw her calling, high calling, in terms of uh, humble service to her nation, to the Commonwealth and to people in all works of life. And uh, I think it was King Charles uh, he, who said that his mother um, saw her life as a destiny to be fulfilled, a calling from God. So uh, <clears throat> her example, I think, is a, reminds us that, um, uh, that uh, whatever our station in life, we are called to be humble people. And uh, there was a sermon here the other week from Jesma on humility, and I'm sure it was a very powerful one. So let's think about, about um, the sin of pride. Uh, as people have thought about the seven so-called deadly sins or serious branches of sin, we've looked at gluttony, greed, lust, envy, anger, sloth, and now pride, which is generally seen to be the root sin of the lot um, and behind the lot. I'll come back to that um, in a little while. Uh, if there's a, there are many texts about pride in the Bible, many passages dozens of them actually, um, but one I like is from Psalm 138, verse 6, where the psalmist says, um, let me see how it goes, though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. In other words, uh, our Lord doesn't really look favorably on people that puff themselves up in, in pride. So um, we'll keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, the first thing to say about pride, I think, is that um, there is a good sort of pride and a good meaning of the word pride. Uh, and we need to recognize that and be honest about it. Uh, certainly we can be proud and recognize and affirm the good value of other people and what they do. There's nothing wrong with being pleased and recognize the value of other people and to be proud of them, affirming them. And likewise... It isn't wrong to be um, to recognise your own gifts and abilities. Um, in Romans chapter 12, St Paul says, "By the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you." 
So don't think of yourself as better than you are, um, but don't think of yourself as less than you are. Um, recognize that it's not pride to recognize that sometimes one is better at some things than other people. Some people, you know, are more talented in certain areas as God has given different gifts. And some people have are called to higher station in life. Not many people are born to rule as the monarch, for example. Um, but they're called to that and it's a matter of their birth. And it's worth remembering um, if we have a true view of ourselves, we may be one of those people that has, you know, many talents. We may be one of those people that has few talents, but it's what we do with them that matters. Uh, St. Paul said to the Corinthians who are boasting about their gifts and abilities and spiritual gifts, what do you have that you did not receive? In other words, who gave you these gifts anyway? They're only gifts from God. If you're brilliant in this area or gifted in that area, it is actually still uh, the gift of God. Um, and our abilities and our status are trusts to serve other people. Um, and some people are called to positions of high authority and high responsibility, but that doesn't mean they're better people or uh, has a basis for pride. So what is, the, uh, what is the sin of pride? Well, here are some um, definitions that I came across. Uh, the inordinate craving for greatness over others. Striving to be greater than everyone else. Striving to be greater than everyone else. There's a character in the New Testament mentioned in passing in the little third letter of John, verse 9. And uh, he was called Diotrephes. And... Um, it's in 3 John chapter, 3 John verse 9. Um, I wrote to the church, he says, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So uh, Diotrephes obviously had tickets on himself. Whoever he was, he thought he was the most important person in the church, more important than the apostles. Now, you, you need to have a fairly big head to think that you're more important than one of Christ's apostles. But Di Diotrephes didn't let that stop him. Um, he was the one uh, who should decide what happens in that little congregation um, and uh, no one else. I, I wanna, I, as I say, there's one of them in every church. <laughs> That's a true Ralph Boll saying. There's one of them in every church. Um, I call this the Diotrephes syndrome. Um, and uh, perhaps we might say that he was a little bit preoccupied with his own importance. Um, so pride perhaps can be considering yourself to be more important than other people in the way that puts you ahead of them or over them and regards them as inferior. Now, there are some people placed over other people. We all have people placed over us. I think it's the writer to the Ecclesiastes who says, everybody has somebody above them. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's got someone above them so that's not a big thing um, but it's when we revel in it and like our important position or strive to achieve it um, if, we, if, we're, if we're given to the sin of pride then probably one of the best occupations we can go into is politics because then we can step over the corpses of all our rivals and, and um, as it were knife them and sabotage them to get to the control of the party maybe I'm being a bit cynical here um, so uh, another C.S. Lewis who never disappointed he made the comment pride is essentially competitive it is the comparison that makes you proud the pleasure of being above the rest um, of viewing oneself as more important or uh, more in the centre than other people now pride can be a secret sin it can be in our heart and not seen by other people the way we look out at the world and see ourselves as more important than other people. Or, and the sin of envy, remember, is looking at other people and resenting them having whatever they have. Or it can be on display. The sin of pride, when it's on display, has a cousin sin called vainglory. We don't use the word vainglory anymore, but we should bring it back. It's a good word. Uh, vaingloriousness. This is when people love to see, love to be on the stage and see other people clapping them and uh, complimenting them and admiring them. And in the internet age with social media, 
there are whole uh, billions of people posting pictures of themselves for the whole world to see how pretty, handsome, clever, funny they are. Um, yes. Uh, in influencers, that's right, they're influencers. They're people who are now got influence and uh, who boast of having millions of followers uh, on, you know, on, the, on the internet. Um, yes, the, uh, you know, when they were invented mirrors, pride had a whole new level of ability to look in the mirror. Now we can um, put the mirror of ourselves up for the world to look at. Jesus had some hard words for the religious leaders of his day who loved other people to see them being religious. Be careful, he said, not to practice, Matthew 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue, synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by others. Truly, I tell you, they have their, received their reward in full. And he said, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So our Lord Jesus didn't have a, a, a positive attitude to vaingloriousness. Um, I love his little humor there. I'm about to give to the needy. Everybody pay attention. Look at my generosity. Um, it's quite a bit of humor, really. Um, Rebecca de Young, in her book on the seven deadly sins, says, Pride excessively concerns excelling others. Vainglory, by contrast, concerns primarily the display of excelling others. Prideful people want more than anything else to be number one. They seek greatness and superiority, even in ways that appropriately belong only to God. Pride is a desire for status. Vainglory, a desire for recognition and acclaim. The whole point of the vainglorious is that others take notice. So um, it's also being often commented about pride as a vice that um, it's very common in uh, ourselves and we overlook it in ourselves and hate to see it in other people. We condemn it when we see it in other people, but we overlook it in ourselves. So let me just think with you a bit, think with me a bit about, about the... Um, how pride operates in our life? How can we observe it a little bit in our lives? Um, sadly, the uh, pride can, can kind of um, take over the personality of some people. Uh, just as we said with the other deadly sins, some of these sins can become dominant in the behavior of people and dominant. We're all tempted to pride, of course, and, the, and we'll come back to that. But... Um, but uh, when pride takes over the personality, it's not a nice thing. Um, the psychologists today talk about um, a type of person, and they, they call it the narcissistic personality type. Uh, that is, people whose personality is really quite self-oriented in, in a noticeable way. Uh, the narcissistic personality, and I'm, I'm going from what I've read on this, not, I'm not an expert, this is the person who always must be the centre of attention and get their own way. And they'll pop up and dominate whatever group or seek to be at the front or in the centre. Um, they have a profound need for admiration and a very large and overrated sense of their own self-importance. And apparently this usually goes along with uh, very little or no emotional empathy for other people. So they, they won't care how they treat and push other people around as long as they can get themselves the attention they want. Um, so one, um, one uh, writer says, when a person truly believes in their feelings of grandiosity and self-importance, this is a man called Jack Lewis, he says, their exaggerated sense of entitlement will inevitably leave them convinced that they're more deserving than everyone else. They will feel perfectly within their rights to take more of their fair share of any commodity. End of quote. So, for example, it might be time or airplay or influence or how much they speak in a particular meeting or committee or what power they have. They will feel entitled to take more than other people. Um, he makes the intriguing suggestion 
that uh, for some people, uh, this sort of behavior may be a compensation for actually not feeling very significant inside themselves, for low self-value. And he quote, quote him again, at the heart of the most troublesome narcissist's external pursuit of admiration and positive affirmation is often a profound sense of worthlessness. It may be so deep down the person doesn't admit it. So when we encounter such people, we may want to look behind the annoying self-centeredness of them and maybe behind it all they're feeling a little bit empty and they need to feel important by pushing themselves to the top. Who knows? Uh, now, pride can also ruin religion and moral virtues. Um, Jesus told that famous parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector going up in the synagogue, in the synagogue to pray or to pray, or is it, um, up to the temple. He said, it says in Luke chapter 18, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So the, the, the person who says, look how generous and humble I am. Um, uh, they probably fall very quickly into the sin of pride. Um, as someone said, they are proud in their humility, proud that they are not proud. So once, once humility sees how humble it is, then pride creeps up and takes over. Um, the poet Coleridge had a line, and the devil did grin, for his darling sin is the pride that apes humility. And one of my favorite old authors, William Durnall, on, wrote on spiritual pride. Pride, he said, can say, take sanctuary in the holiest actions and hide itself under the skirt of virtue itself. And thus, while a man is exercising his charity, pride may be the idol in secret for which he lavishes, his, lavishes out his gold so freely. I love that line. Um, pride can hide itself under the skirt of virtue. It's very, very um, real, isn't it? Um, look how pious, humble, generous, kind I am and uh, not without realizing that pride is there. Now, pride can disrupt communities, of course, and relationships, and bring on rejection by other people. That's the reason why St. Paul exhorts the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13, love, he says, is not proud. Because some of the Corinthians apparently were, say, were asserting their own importance against the well-being and the feelings of other Corinthian church members. Um, and putting them down or criticizing them or whatever they were doing. And uh, because that's not loving behavior. Um, now, I said to you that pride, uh, I've been saying all along that pride is regarded as the root of the other sins. And it, if you think about it quite only briefly, I think you'll see with me why it is. So gluttony feeds itself. That's the main thing. It's all about what I want, what I crave. Envy actually resents other people for their gifts and achievements, as if they detract from one's own importance and well-being. And it can only be pride feeding that, feeling that they've got something, we must have lost something. If other people are being acclaimed, then I'm not the centre of attention. If, they're being, if they've got something that I haven't got, I must be somehow lacking. It's, a, it's what they, you might call a zero-sum game. In zero-sum game, if someone gets something, I must have lost something. Doesn't necessarily follow, but that's the way pride thinks about it. Anger is the reaction, too, of a proud heart. How dare you? How dare you block what I want to do? 
I'm angry with you because it's what I want to do, you know? Um, and uh, never mind the fact that we don't necessarily have the right to pursue our own goals all the time and the world can be very inconveniently not going along with us. And then sloth, how does that relate to pride? Well, I don't care. It may be important, but I don't care about it because ultimately I couldn't be bothered. That's pride. I couldn't be bothered. And then, of course, lust makes sense self-satisfaction of one's own desires, using others for gratification, more important than respecting others, and greed, wanting more for yourself than you need, even sometimes to the cost of other people. So it's easy to see how these things work. And then, as I've said, pride spoils our relationship with God. Um, Though the Lord is great, says the psalmist, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. The people who are so proud, they... um, sneer at God and, um, and uh, push themselves up unduly into, in the, into the, the presence of God. So final thought is how can we um, deal with pride? How can we deal with it? Um, well, it's very hard to deal with. Benjamin Franklin said there's perhaps no one of our natural pra- pra- passions so hard to subdue as pride. Disguise it, struggle with it, Stifle it, mortify it as much as you please. It is still alive and will every now and then peep out and show itself. Well, I've got some, um, just some thoughts for us I share with you. Three thoughts. If we get our value from the fact that God loves us, we don't have to make ourselves great because God's love is gracious and unconditional. He loves us whether we're the most powerful person or most gifted person in the world, or we are complete nobodies. Isn't that lovely? He loves us just the way we are, you know, like that hymn, Just As I Am. And that's, the, that's where we get our value from, not our, our sense of being worthwhile and significant, uh, from God's love. He's created us in his image and he's redeemed us in Christ. And let that be enough for us to make us feel worthwhile. Um, And he showered his grace and love upon us in Christ. He sent Christ to die for our sins. And as we know, the grace of God removes all pride and boasting. You know, it's like that Easter hymn, um, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them uh, to my God, you know. Um, You know, I lay them down. Um, I I read the story that Queen Elizabeth once said to one of her chaplains, how I wish the Lord would come again in my lifetime, she said to him. And he said, why is that, Your Majesty? And she said, because I would so dearly love to lay my crown at his feet. Is that a lovely thought? Because that biblical thought, when, when the Lord comes again, we will put our crowns at his feet. Our own status will be at his feet and worship him. Um... And then, of course, we need to be very careful of the temptations to pride that come from status. Some people are called to high rank and to great importance in the world. And those people are, of course, tempted to think because they're being called to high importance that they really are more important than other people or better people than other people. Um, As the proverb goes, it takes a steady hand to hold a full cup. Um, and people who are being applauded and approved by other people all the time and flattered. That's a big temptation. And then the the third and last thought, uh, let the ongoing lure of pride drive us to a healthy self-despair. Or as Paul said to the Corinthians, if we must boast, boast in the Lord, you know? Uh, Cling to God's grace and, and power and love and boast in the Lord. Um... So I think it's really the great love of God for us that deals with our lure, the, the lure to make ourselves great. The final quote I want to leave with you is from Pope Benedict. It's a lovely statement. He said, God considers us so important that we are worthy of his suffering and thus all human dignity appears in the mirror of the crucified one. That's what makes us uh, worthwhile.
takes the pressure off, you know. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. We hope it's been an encouragement to you for your spiritual life. If you'd like what we produce here, please subscribe to this channel. That'll be a great help to our ministry. And if you want to support us financially uh, via donation, you can do so in the link below this video. Uh, and that donation goes through our website. Thank you for watching again. And we pray that you'll be encouraged in your understanding and knowledge of God. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.